Hello and good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to Break the Wheel, Ending the Cycle of Police Violence. I'm Nisha Bochway, the Dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this critical conversation. At the heart of our mission here at the Humphrey School lies a commitment to advancing policy solutions that promote equity, justice, and social change. Our role as a policy school extends far beyond the classroom, beyond these walls of the Humphrey School as we strive to engage with pressing issues facing our communities and drive meaningful action. I'd like to thank the African American Leadership Forum. Where are you? Can we just give a wave or a clap? They're in the house and I'm wearing their pin um, for their partnership. Uh, also their CEO, Adir Mosley for being partners in how we frame and deliver this conversation today. Tonight's event underscores the profound importance of our role as a hub for policy, dialogue and action. In the aftermath, of the tragic murder of George Floyd and the ensuing national reckoning on racial justice, it is imperative that we confront the systemic issues that per perpetuate police violence and institutionalized racism. As a policy school, we have a unique opportunity to bring together diverse perspectives, expertise, and lived experiences to inform policy solutions that address these very urgent challenges. We are honored to have with us two fantastic guests tonight who bring invaluable insights and perspectives to this discussion, whose expertise and dedication have significantly impacted the realms of justice and reform. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, whose office successfully prosecuted the police responsible for George, George Floyd's death, joins us to share his experiences and reflections on the path to justice as detailed in his groundbreaking book, Break the Wheel, Ending the Cycle of Police Violence. Ellison is driven by a desire to address legal and justice-related issues directly a passion that traces back to his early career as a defense attorney and advocate for criminal justice reform. You can give him an applause. Accompanying A.G. Ellison is my dear friend, Kenneth Polite. Kenneth is the former U.S. Assistant Attorney General. His extensive experience and dedication to reforming the criminal justice system bring an invaluable perspective to our conversation. My first encounter with Kenneth was in person as a college student in Harvard Yard. Our paths have intersected numerous times since graduation and I'm grateful that it's brought him here to the Humphrey School tonight. And you can give Kenneth a round of applause. <laughs> So as we engage in this critical dialogue, let us recognize the power of policy to drive change and create a more just and equitable society. Through rigorous research, informed debate, and collaborative action, we can work towards meaningful policy solutions that address the root causes of police violence and advance racial justice. It's important to emphasize that healthy debate and discussion are integral to a thriving democracy, and we want to have that healthy debate and discussion here tonight. Let us lean into uh, um, and across differences, recognizing that we may not always agree, and that respectful engagement fosters understanding and progress. So before we welcome Keith and Kenneth to the stage, I'd like to welcome Associate Prof Professor Kathy Quick. Dr. Quick's work exemplifies what we aim to achieve here at the Humphrey School, bringing together diverse perspectives to tackle complex and contentious public policy problems. With her extensive background in public management and leadership, as well as her deep expertise in issues of public safety and policing, Dr. Quick has been at the forefront of facilitating constructive dialogue and problem solving. After Dr. Quick, we'll, uh, we'll welcome Keith and Kenneth. And so once again, thank you for joining us and Kathy Quick.
Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see all of you here. Um, Dean Botchway invited me to introduce our speakers, in part due to my work on bringing diverse stakeholders together to work on complex and often divisive public issues. And I believe it is fair to say there is hardly a public issue that is more complex and divisive than public safety. Among the many things that I have learned from years of working with activists, police officers, elect offic elected officials, and other community members around public safety, I'd like to help set the stage tonight by underlining two things. You may have come tonight with strong opinions about what we should do about public safety. That's excellent. However, we cannot actually find innovative, actionable, impactful solutions without truly understanding the nature of the problem. And we gain those insights by listening carefully. So my first suggestion is that tonight you listen closely, not only to what our speakers say about solutions, but also to what they say about their experiences, feelings, values, and knowledge of the problems. We each have different experiences of and expectations around safety or the lack thereof. Safety is a matter of identity, connecting strongly with gender, race, place of origin, ability, sexual orientation, religion, and other factors. If you find your eyes opened tonight by hearing something from a new perspective, please recognize the labor, the vulnerability, the wisdom, the effort, and perhaps the pain that the other person invested into your learning. Please reciprocate it by being truly open yourself and acting on that knowledge. So my second suggestion is that you make a commitment right this minute to attend to this conversation with an openness to act on what you learn from these two gentlemen and not just take in the lessons you learned as something nice to know. It's now my pleasure and my honor to introduce our two speakers in a slightly more formal and elaborate way um, than Dean Bachwe did. Keith Ellison is Minnesota's Attorney General, a position in which he has served since 2019. Previously, he represented Minnesota's 5th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he championed consumer, worker, environmental, and civil and human rights protections. Keith Ellison was the first Muslim individual to be elected to Congress and subsequently became the first Muslim and person of color elected to statewide office here in Minnesota. Before that, he had served in the Minnesota House of Representatives and as executive director of the Legal Rights Center, having received his law degree here at the University of Minnesota in 1990. As you all know, or will know from reading his book, as in Minnesota Attorney General, he led the prosecution team following the May 2020 murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, which resulted in the longest sentence ever received for any police officer for killing a civilian while on duty in Minnesota. Kenneth Polite Jr. was confirmed by the U.S. Senate to serve as Assistant Attorney General of the United States. As the head of the Dep Department of Justice's criminal division, he led a team of over 1,400 attorneys and staff members responsible for investigating and prosecuting complex criminal cases involving public corruption, securities and health frauds, cybercrime, and other offenses. As Assistant Attorney General, he also worked extensively with counterparts around the world on multinational and cross-border investigations. Previously, he had served as U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Louisiana and as Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York. In addition to his government service, he was the Chief Compliance Officer at a Fortune 500 company and now is a global co-leader of the law firm Sidley Austin's White Collar Defense and Investigations Practice. He is a cum laude graduate of Georgetown University Law Center and a recipient of an honorary doctorate from Loyola University. Let's welcome them and please come to the stage. Hey everybody. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, a hand of applause for uh, all of the organizers. There's a lot of folks in here who have made a lot of efforts to make tonight a reality. So if you could give a round of applause for our folks who've been involved in planning, organizing. Uh, our attorney general has a fantastic team. You talk a lot about your team throughout the book as well, but a, a lot of them are in the room with us today. Yeah, we got a few. Yeah. 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 Not the least of which is uh, one of our teammates was Mike Freeman right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I had a pleasure of speaking with, with Mike before we walked in. Thank you for your years of service, Mike. Uh, well, I want to start off, obviously, this conversation is one that's framed as a being about police reform, but I want to frame it uh, more generally about public safety, public health. Yeah. Uh, and in that vein, I want to talk about our personal health. How are you doing, brother? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm living life to the fullest. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes life pushes back on me, but you know, I'm all right. Yeah. I'm in good health and I'm on the mend. Yes. Yes. You are a, a soldier for us. Thank you so much for uh for being here. Uh despite that. Uh, so let's talk about before we talk about the book, I want to just talk a little bit about you. And I love and a lot of people here know a lot about your narrative. Um, but I want to make sure everyone has a sense of who you are as a person. Uh, we talked a little bit uh, backstage about our connectivity to the state of Louisiana. You've got roots, deep roots. Your family's got roots throughout this country, but particularly in the Deep South. Tell us a little bit about your family's experiences and how those have shaped you as a public servant. Yeah, you know, we're all a bit of a, we're all a bit of a product of our, of everybody who came before us, right? Everybody who came before us put a little bit into who we are right here, right now. And uh, my situation is the same as anyone else's. And, um, you know, I see my son right there, Councilman Ellison. How you doing there, man? Thanks for coming. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so we give guys. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, my I never had a chance to meet my grandfather, whose name is Frank Martinez. He and I never sat down. But I sat down with his daughter, my mother, and she made it real clear to us that he had a life that she admired. He was a civil rights activist, NAACP person in Natchitoches Parish, Louisiana. He was an industrial arts teacher. He was a farmer. He, uh, and he uh, worked with the local NAACP to help Black voters get a chance to decide who was going to represent them. And often at threat to his life, uh, you know, there was a, um, you know, my my uncle Boo, his name is Carol Balthazar. They he, he used to have a big container that he put tractor fuel in. When they boycotted my grandfather and told him that he couldn't, he was stirring up a fuss, and he wasn't going to be allowed to get gas. They were boycotting him. He went and got tractor fuel in his car and I don't know if that even worked or not but they they were mechanics so they figured something out uh he um he taught industrial arts to black students uh and uh, was very proud of that and he um also uh was was received calls to the house frequently about how they got that n-word tied up to a tree and um they didn't actually but they would terrorize my grandmother with that my grandmother, grandma, her name was Doris Martinez uh, Baltazar, and she had to endure, you know, these kind of threats from from him. And my mom, my grandfather died when my mom was about eighteen. It's about nineteen fifty eight. He died in a tractor accident. Um, and uh, she would tell us how, when she was going to Xavier in New Orleans, she would, you know, the signs, the the whites only signs were movable on the bus. And, you know, they would slide back and forth as to wherever the color line was on that bus. And she and her friends would take them and shove them into her book bag. And she said they had quite a collection by the time she graduated. <laughs> and so this is the folks who who uh, raised me, you know, I mean, uh, and and all of those folks, is, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were farm people. They were uh, industrial, you know, factory workers. On my father's side, my my grandfather worked at Ford Motor Company, yeah. and he was a farmer before that. And uh, but they all insisted on education, so my mom and dad went to school, you know, and made sure that we did. Uh, and so th these are the people who raised us. My father was a person who who, who is, he my father's ninety five years old, and my brother tells me, don't make plans for his ninety sixth birthday because he plans on being there. <laughs> Uh, and he's in he's in he's in pretty good shape. Doesn't walk, but he's has an active mind, and he lives right there in Detroit. And um, and but he was a no excuses kind of person, you know. And he was one of those kind of people who it was interesting, you know. Earlier we were talking to some folks around mental health and how African American men deal with mental health, and mostly how we don't deal with it, right. <laughs> you know. 
but he was one of those suck it up and deal with it and um and uh no excuses and um you have to you have to figure out a way to to, to get through it and overcome it yeah so that's a little bit about my background yeah. you know you know and and and, and, I, and I do call upon it quite a quite a bit i i like to uh, share it with my kids i'm very proud to tell jeremiah that you know he he's not in public service because of me i mean frank martinez and Doris Martinez were teaching at St. Matthew's School in Natchitoches Parish, yeah. Louisiana, several generations ago. And that probably explains why you're doing public service as much as what I'm doing or your mom's doing. That's what I was going to ask is, you know, this the, the book is about breaking the wheel, but there are some wheels, there's some other cycles that you're touching upon, including the one in, involving your 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 own son, yeah. you know, that cycle of public service. How How important is that to you? to see that legacy continue within your family? You know, it's central and it doesn't have to be an elective of office. That's one way to serve. It's, I think it's an honorable way to serve, but there are other ways as well. I mean, you know, uh, my, my, my son Elijah is in the army mm -hmm. and he went there to serve his country. And he went there, he was a combat medic and became a nurse and is a nurse today. Uh, my other son is a prosecutor uh, in Hennepin County and he it believes it's important for him to try to help make sure Minnesotans are safe. And I don't know what my daughter's going to do next, but she's got plans and they probably involve public service in one way or another. Yeah. yeah. There's another, there's another cycle that you touched upon in your initial answer and you touched upon it a little bit uh, gently in the book. I know that it's, uh, it's probably a, a, a sensitive issue, but uh, this cycle of threats, you know, your family having endured threats yeah. in, the, in their past. And I know at different times in your career in public service, you've had to endure that. Um, talk, tell me a little bit about how your family has handled that. What are your thoughts about breaking that cycle? Um, quite honestly, um, I'm probably a little more cavalier than I should be about it. Um, I'm probably a little cavalier about it. I'm probably like, you know, I'm easy to find, you know I mean? Um, is my attitude about it. But they were threatening to kill my grandfather for helping Black people vote. So I'm not scared of these people, right? And um, that's just sort of like how it is, you know? I mean, I remember it did bother me when my son was getting that nasty notes um, because, I mean, I feel like I could, you know, as a parent, you can protect yourself, but when they start coming your child's way, that's different. But still, you know, he, you know, we did. It's the cost. It literally is the price of forward progress in our society. If you're not willing to have people, somebody really dislike you a lot, um, you're not willing. You, then you then you're resigning yourself to the status quo. Because as we found out on January 6, you know, people will kill you to keep the world the way they want it to be. You know, and if you want the world to be just, fair, and inclusive, they they will take extreme umbrage to that. And if you're not willing to stand up and say, no, we're going to insist upon liberty and justice for all, then, you know, then you're never going to get it. Certainly true. You spent some time in Washington, D.C., my friend. And I'm so glad to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, man, that is just that was one of I've made a lot of bad decisions. in life. <laughs> that was not one of them. Yeah. I mean, I really enjoy being the attorney general, being home, being able to serve my neighbors. Yeah, I was able to serve neighbors in D.C. as well. But, you know, there is a certain amount of just um, the ability to move something you're passionate about forward. And whereas in Congress, it's just the, just the winds are so far few in between. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, we're, you know, it, it, really in Congress, you almost need a crisis to do anything. We needed a crisis to make any progress on mortgage reform. We needed a crisis to make any progress on, you know, you, you got to have a, a a massive drought or a massive tornado. Then maybe we'll think about doing something on climate. We got to have George Floyd. Then they don't even quite get to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. So being in this job to me um, is great. And this name is, this hall is named for Walter Mondale. And uh, and um, when I was running for attorney general, 
leaving Congress, a lot of my good friends, people who got great affection for me and love, like, what is you doing? And why are you doing it? I'm like, well, look, it's, and, but Walter Mondale says to me when I sat down with him, he said, Keith, I'm going to tell you, I've been the ambassador to Japan. I've been the vice president of the United States. I have been a senator in the United States. My favorite job was Minnesota Attorney General. You're going to love it. And uh, there's a little there's a little Walter Mondaleism for you right there, <laughs> and uh, he said you're gonna love it. And he he writes about it in his biography, you know, about how much he enjoyed doing the work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, let's talk a little bit about the book. Yep. Um, I got mine too. I got mine right here too. I got to get one for some family members oh, later yeah. too as well. Uh, I'm sure you, I mean, you've got a lot of stories, you know, there's a lot of impactful stories in your life. I'm sure people have come up to you and said, you know, Keith, why don't you write a book about this or write a book about that? What prompted you to write a book now about this particular topic? Well, quite honestly, um, a lot of people have given our team nice words because of the way the case turned out. As I told you, if it hadn't been for uh, Mike Freeman, uh, he helped finance the case. He helped give advice on the case. He helped critique. He helped uh, do um, a lot of really critical things. He was very kind to the Floyd family. I, I want the world to know about that. So part of it is just telling the story of what really did actually happen. But why did I feel like I wanted to get up at 5 a.m. and write this book for six months? And And the reason is, is because this this will will never break unless we unless we understand it better unless we have the optimism to understand that it can be broken so many people who i've talked to just feel like well look uh, police brutality against african americans is just a fact of life this is just the way it's going to be and it's always going to be this way and that's just it and then other people say there's no such thing as police brutality certainly not against any particular racial group and I've been in conversations with both. And so my thought is, let us let me write this book here. Let me try to put, get somebody to put it out there so that we can put a stake in the ground that we can then like have a conversation around. And then we can get into debate about it. I was in a, uh, I was talking to some conservative guys this weekend um, about uh, this book. This book brought, me and some black conservatives, uh, Glenn Lowry, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but it brought us, it, this book brought us together because they they played what I believe is nothing but partisan propaganda in this film, that crazy film that they put out there. I said, none of that is true and I'll talk to you about it if you, if you want. And so this book created an occasion for a dialogue and I, and therefore for everybody in this room, there's a book inside of you. I hope that you let it out, right? You should write it. The story needs to be told. I'm going to tell you this. When going through this case, um, uh, Mr. Friedman over there says, Keith, you need to read this book. And it's called Freddie's Last Ride. Freddie who? Well, Freddie Gray. And Freddie Gray uh, was killed. But the problem is because they did not get real precise about what the medical examiner could show. Those cases never, there was never really an, any meaningful accountability in those cases. And they're all revolved around, was he hurt before he got in the truck or after? The, the creating that doubt is reasonable doubt, and that amounts to acquittals, okay? So that book, that book, Freddie's Last Ride, put enough caution into my mind to be like, you know what, when it comes to building the medical case here, the link has got to be tight, very tight. Because if there's any wiggle room, the defense is going to run right through it. So we put a lot of energy, time, resource into the medical case. And it wasn't cheap. So we needed all the help we can get. Yeah, so on that point about all the help you can get, you right. talk a lot in the book about the just the wide range of resources that were brought to the table. Right. You know, support from, from Mike and his office was obviously instrumental, but you talk about your relationship with the U.S. attorney at the time, yep. uh, who was a Trump appointee and yet stood 
pretty actively you, with you in terms of the, the the early stages of this work, from what I understand. I'll admit to being shocked. <laughs> but it turns out that uh, Eric Mac Erica McDonald's a pretty good uh, lawyer and uh, and is there to do her job right. You know, um, I'm not. I don't know about the politics, and I'll leave those to the side. We weren't there for politics. We were there for this case, and that's what I laser beamed yeah. my intention on. And yeah, so I will say, yeah, we talked with we, my talked about talking to Bill Barr at one point. I should, uh, yeah, I was interesting. I was, I mean, I can't imagine anybody who I disagree with more <laughs> politically. I can think of a few people. Well, maybe, maybe yeah, they're right, <laughs> right, right. But my point is, you know, yeah. he said he was he wanted to see this case prosecuted. He said he would let the state go first. Yeah. That's all I needed. Yeah. So to my attitude is, I'm not going to collect a bunch of people I'm mad at because we have a case to win. I'd rather win the case. And th th that's had to be the priority, yeah. right? To putting on the best case we could. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, if we lost the case, think about how demoralizing that will be. Think about how under how that might undermine any, any kind of public confidence and how it might even embolden the kind of treatment that George Floyd received. It was important to say, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to accept help from where it is offered if we can use it. Well, and, yeah, I want to talk about. I want to make sure because I know everybody may not have re uh, read the book, but you talk about basically the elite team of lawyers that you were able to put together, special counsel that you brought in to try this case with your team. You had one of the best appellate lawyers in this entire country as part of that team. You had one of the best trial and jury, uh, mock jury uh, consultants as part of this team supporting right. you. Can you talk a little bit about just the breadth and the expense that went into putting this successful trial into place? Well, let me be real clear. Every single thing we did was within the law and within the rules. Everything we did was the regular order of any trial. It's available to anybody who wants to try the cases. And in my opinion, when it comes to some police cases, I think that greater care should be put into those cases, not because I think that police officers deserve more punishment than others. I actually don't. But what I do believe is that if you, that the legitimacy of our system depends upon people believing that there's equal justice under the law. And if people don't believe there's equal justice under the law, then what will happen is it'll undermine people's respect for that system and the system won't be able to function properly. So we, so I was like, look, you know, I don't know if we're going to win or not, but I know this, no one will be able to say we didn't do a good job. Right. That, that was, that was my commitment. Cause I told us, I mean, not only did we pull together this team, but we went and got people to pump up the team. You know, <laughs> we went and got Eric Holder That's to come, right. come on the, come on the call and be like, Eric, Give them a good word because they need some inspiration. Yeah. We got, uh, you know, uh, Eric Garner's mom, you know, uh, Gwendolyn Carr got on and she said, my son never got justice. So she was kind of part of our team because I needed this team to be inspired on fire, you know. Uh, but we, yeah, so the, so the first thing is that, you know, we had uh, at the attorney general's office back in those days, we had uh, a small criminal prosecution team. Uh, we only had around three or four people who right. did criminal prosecution. We used to have as many as 12, 13 people. Uh, we're back up to that now. But back then, we were very small, and, and yet we had to deal with this case. We didn't have anybody who had prosecuted a police officer, and um, that is a sp that takes a certain sort of uh, talent. And you know that, uh, DOJ, you just can't walk into those cases the way you do other cases. They're a little different. Um, I mean, even the Bruton, even some of the technical legal right. issues, yeah. you know, can can grind you up. But one friend of mine named Jerry Blackwell, who uh, was uh, he and I generally when I would see Jerry, it was him on the other side of the table. <laughs> so I'm attorney general and we're suing 3M. Who's representing 3M? Usually him. <laughs> we're, we're suing uh, some other big company. He, he's on the other side. Now, he and I have been friends for years. We uh, started together. He's, I think, one year ahead of me. And I always admired him, liked him, and knew he was a wonderful lawyer. 
Uh, and I knew he was a wonderful lawyer because he uh, beat us a few times. <laughs> and so he was good at what he did. But when this started, I said, look, I just want to talk to you because my thought was they're going to demonize George Floyd. And if you can make some of these big Fortune 500 polluters look good, then you ought to be able to <laughs> help humanize George Floyd. And uh, because George Floyd was being dehumanized, right? As people often are, you know? So he was critical. Then there was another fellow by the name of Steve Slisher. And Steve uh, had done police cases. He's a former assistant attorney general, former US attorney general, AUSA. And he, you know, you know, you may not know Steve, but you know his work because if anybody, has anybody here ever heard of Jacob Wetterling? It was Steve's work that actually brought the truth of who murdered him to that family through some amazing legal work that they did. And so I called uh, Steve and I said, look, Ed, I don't know what I want you to do, but would you just kind of talk with us about it? I'll make you an assistant AG. Then of course, there were some other awesome folks. I mean, I talked to Mike every Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm. He and I got on the phone. Then we also got on the, then we also uh, talked to a, a young hungry go-getter late named Josh Larson, who is a very aggressive young man who, is going to be isn't isn't is going to be a great lawyer one day. There was a very sharp um, uh, legal mind, a woman named Jean Beardorf, who was, I think is, she's a judge now, right? So I mean, and she was this was Mike's folks, uh, and then there was some other folks on our team who were our lawyers, like a guy who is a judge now named Matt Frank. Uh, he is a conservative, uh, of small C, not big C, but kind of a you know he's a traditional prosecutor who does things the way that prosecutors traditionally do them. And, and so, you know, it was interesting to have him and Jerry in the conversation because they had different views on things, you know? Um, and Neil Katyal, of course. Oh, and so of course, Neil, uh, well, let me, I can't leave out Neil Katyal. <laughs> Neil Katyal might be, he may have argued more cases in front of the United States Supreme Court than anybody, yeah. than anybody. And uh, I mean, and uh, and he again, he he was he was there, and he was very much part of our trial team, mm -hmm. uh, Ken, because we didn't want to create appellate issues. Right. So, if any of you guys who are lawyers out there, you want to incorporate your appellate lawyers into your trial, because you don't want to do things in the trial that are going to get your case flipped on appeal. So it's a good idea to say, hey, these issues are coming up. Um, what do you think about him? So he was constantly doing that. We are, and so we we had this team, and what what we did is we had to organize, and we had more, and that wasn't even it. I mean, we had some young lawyers in my office who said, "I want to be on this case. I can either cry about what happened to George Floyd, or I can be on this case. I want to be on this case. This is my therapy, yeah. you yeah. know." And I don't think Natasha would mind me telling you her name, uh, Zuri uh, Balkaman, another amazing young lawyer. And then there was. Lola Velasquez, who was extremely helpful. So, and I, I can't even mention them all. They, yeah, you, lift, you lift up the names of uh, your yeah. and team members throughout. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is, and this is kind of where I, the trial wonk in me kind of starts thinking a little bit about this, having been involved in prosecuting some high profile whole public lot. officials <laughs> in my in my own career. Sure. You know, you sometimes struggle with the idea of, well, should I be the person yeah. up there? you know, on behalf of the people trying this case or taking some part of the case, did you come close? To, what was your thinking around yourself being up in court? I know you were there watching a lot of it, but did you, did you think about actually it, litigating it it's yourself at all? Well, you know, uh, John Stiles, who's part of our team, was certainly there. He did a, John's not a lawyer. He's a, he's a, a, a communications expert. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he knows that I thought about should I take the opening? Should, yeah. What should I do? And I, deci I decided after thinking about it quite a lot not to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, there was a specific reason. And the reason was this cannot be about me, right? If this ends up being the Keith Ellison show, then it's going to ruin everything. This has got to be about we're pursuing one thing and one thing only justice, right? Mm -hmm. We're not trying to get anywhere with this case except to a just fair verdict. And then everything else will take care of itself. Then maybe that will inspire legislators to move and, you know, other policy leaders to take 
action or but we this cannot be something where it appears as though uh i'm trying to grab the microphone now i will tell you this i do think there's a role for me to play in some of the in, in litigation as a matter of fact i was about to argue in front of the minnesota supreme court yesterday until i got surgery on my shoulder then i had to hand it over to somebody <laughs> so i don't think that i should never do it yeah but yeah. this case but but this thing on monday was when I actually introduced a bill to allow people who are out of custody on felony probation to vote. I introduced that bill back in 2003. Wow. It got passed in 2023. And now in, in you know, in the in the anti-democracy forces have challenged the law. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna argue this one. Yeah. And I was all set to argue it right up until crash boom you got to go get arthroscopic surgery. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's, that's when I handed it over, but that's a testament I, to you having a strong team, oh, right, to right. the mantle though. But, but I was, re but I do think there's a role, but I didn't think there was a role there. Yeah. That way it had to be viewed as pure, yeah. right? Because here's the thing, you know, there are people who don't want, who want to say George Floyd got what he had come in, who want to say there's no institutional racism, who want to, they want to say these things that aren't true and they're getting louder every single day, it feels like. And, 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 and so if they say, oh, this is nothing but Ellison's ego trip, mm -hmm. then that would weaken the power of the case. So I had to say, I'm going to uh, play coach. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be chief inspirer, chief organizer. Uh, I'll talk with the court about logistics. I'll work with uh, Mike and I'll work with all the other uh, offices that are, you know, involved, but I'm not going to be the one, the voice that stands up and makes that case yeah. to the jury. Plus we had really good people. I he mean, Jerry, yeah. Jerry was out of sight. Steve was out of sight. Matt was out of sight. Aaron Eldridge was out of sight. So I didn't really need to, yeah. you know. So you took yourself out of the, 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 the limelight there, but I know there's a group of people that you kept in the limelight and your team kept in the limelight the whole time. And that is George Floyd's family. Oh Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the victim-centered approach that you yes. brought to this case that you tried to bring to your office's work and, and broadly how the criminal justice system needs to bring more of a victim-centered focus to its activity? Ken, I got to say thank you for even asking yeah. that question. No, look, in our criminal justice system, given how race has been infused into the criminal justice system for so many centuries, actually, we all, when we think of criminal justice reform, we all, our mind immediately goes to how is the defendant being treated? We think about that in terms of like, you know, traffic stops, death penalty, all this stuff. And I'm not saying we shouldn't think about that. We should think about that. But one of the people in the criminal justice system who is ignored is the victim. And when the victim is a person of color, the, system, the, the rules don't change. The same rules apply. <laughs> you're second class citizen. We're going to ignore you. But I want to tell you, you know, uh, that the, we thought the family was uh, a, a uh, I mean, they were a, they're a model of dignity undergoing tremendous hardship. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that if any, if you ever should be so unfortunate just to suffer a tragedy like they did, if you can hold yourself together the way they did, that's a tremendous uh, uh, group to 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 model yourself on. And they 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 shared the money. In fact, they were in the news earlier this week because I guess they gave a scholarship to a college and you know for black students. And now somebody wants to sue because they think it's uh, inappropriate or. Anyway, but th this is evidence of them giving money so that so that they can help people who've been less fortunate in this world. So um, they are, the, and we've got it. And I'll say this about the victims. They never wanted revenge. And victims, when you're a victim of a crime, you might think all kind of, some people are forgiving. Some people are, are very, you know, they want revenge. Some people are in the middle. Some people just want an apology. Some people want to hear the defendant admit what they did. Some people don't care to hear it at all. I mean, victim responses range. But uh, I think if we lift up victims more, uh, that what we will get is a more just criminal justice system. Because yeah. victims don't always want retribution. Sometimes they want acknowledgement. Sometimes they want therapy. <laughs> Sometimes they might want any number of things. And 
Um, I, I definitely appreciate what you shared. We had a wonderful victim witness advocate, uh, Vernona Boswell, best Critical part of the team, <laughs> best in the world. Vernona Boswell uh, knew how to help this family work through their pain. And she told me and everybody else, don't expect them to act any kind of way. Yeah. You can't tell me they're going to, they, they can act any kind of way they want. They have lost. And, and, and they, but, but, but it's not like, it doesn't fall into a formula. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had those experiences where uh, you've had cases and I've had defendants who have been sentenced to life sentences and the family still feels like this is not enough. Right. Uh, I think it is one of the clear limitations of the criminal justice system is that it doesn't, it's part of it. Accountability is the first step, I think, is what you say in the book. Sure, it's not sure. the entire process, though. And this is this is kind of jumping ahead to a topic that I wanted to touch upon, but the role of restorative justice in our system. What can we be doing more to institute restorative justice as part of the work that we do uh, in all parts of the, the, the public safety systems that we have? Well, let me tell you, it it, it should be, I mean, I, I think sometimes... Uh, for certain victims, it's not appropriate, but I think it should always be on offer, because for a lot of victims, you ask, you know, you know, there's a great book I would recommend to you guys. Um, um, uh, the author uh, named Surrett, Danielle Surrett. Um, um, somebody can help me figure out the name until we wreck it. Uh, you know, she she does a wonderful job in this book talking about, you know, how you can form restorative processes and systems. And um, I, I know for, for some victims, it's just not appropriate for them. They're not ready for that. But I think that for many cases, it should be something that is at least available. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have enough uh, expertise in the area, to tell you the truth. I think we we kind of we kind of say, well, look, you know, okay, so if, you, if the defendant is convicted, they're going to lose money, they're going to lose freedom, or they're going to lose both, and that's kind of it, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, that's why I like, as Attorney General, we use civil tools a lot because then we can use, we can get injunct, we can make them do fund educational yeah. programs, like when it comes to like uh, like tobacco cessation, you know, they're paying the, the company has to pay to re-educate people and help people quit and things like that. Criminal justice system doesn't really have as many tools. It has restitution, it has jail, it has fines. Yeah. 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 And but it, but there's no reason that it needs to stay limited. We should we should find out what and particularly in some of these areas around policing. I'm gonna tell you a case, uh a police case that happened in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. This was a police officer who thought a woman, uh a white police officer, female, thought a black woman was stealing. Uh, approached her and um, they were arguing uh, and the woman said, I'm going to tase you very much like the case we had here. Tases her, but it wasn't a taser. It was a gun. Mm -hmm. Shoots her. One time she does not die. Says, oh my God, runs to the woman's aid, gets medical attention. The woman survives. Now, I mean, some of y'all might not agree with this, and some of y'all may agree with this, but the, the the victim ended up saying at the woman's resolution of her case that she didn't want her to have a permanent conviction. Now, I'm not saying that's the right answer. I'm saying it was her answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the but the victims, but what she said is that the woman said she was sorry. She didn't really mean to shoot me. I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm saying that because there was this process available, this particular victim got an answer that was satisfactory for her. Whereas if you just like convict the person, you may never see them again. They may never think about them again. And they're just gone and they're just locked away somewhere. Um, but in that particular situation, you had... Uh, the ability to do some restoration. Yeah. And as I said, I want to emphasize it's not the right answer yeah. for everybody in every case, but for this victim, it was. So we uh, one of the things that uh, our attorney general was referencing earlier before tonight's conversation, we actually had the opportunity to participate in a form of restorative justice with some restoration circles with some young men that are in the audience with us today. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm mindful that that process is one that we have borrowed from other, other cultures. Sure. It is used to address restoration, repair, trauma in any number of uh, circumstances, not just criminal justice, but of right. course, uh, Family, families, counseling. yeah, schools. I, I'm mindful of, of, of uh, my own experience, my family's experience being from New Orleans, 2005 Hurricane Katrina. Oh yeah. Right. And that being a scenario where even today, there are aspects of that experience that have traumatized that region. And there's a lot of parallels that I see from the George Floyd situation, murder, and uh, how traumatic an event it was for this area. Is your is your community still traumatized? Yes, I I would say uh, the community is still traumatized, and it's compounded in many ways. I mean, this, our community is so traumatized that it's extremely difficult to evaluate any officer involved shooting case or, or killing case. Why is it difficult? Because no matter what you decide, there are certain people that are going to be certain that the officer did no wrong at all. And there are going to be other people who are going to be certain that the officer did wrong and needs to go to prison forever. Very little space for um, what you did may be wrong, but it's not necessarily a crime. Maybe you need a training response. Just very binary. Uh, and uh, that's just the way it is. And, and, and we need healing from it. You compound it. Uh, I remember, you know, uh, when I was a law student, uh, back in 1989, there was a couple, Lillian Weiss and Lloyd Smalley. 80, one was 86, one, one was 68, the other one was 72. And they were, uh, they died of smoke inhalation in a botched drug raid, execution of service of a drug warrant. Uh, and uh, they died in that. And 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 then the, shortly after that, a group of my friends called the Embassy Suites Five were beat up at the Embassy Suites Hotel. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, a guy named Tysel Nelson is shot in the back. I actually represented his family on that and on and on and on. And I can tell you that I felt that same trauma because when I got the call on May 26, 2020, that this horrific thing had been that had happened to George Floyd, I remembered being two blocks north of that very block on 36 and Chicago when a kid named Lawrence Miles, who's now a 45-year-old man, was shot in the back by a Minneapolis police officer, we took his case to trial and we lost. A jury said, we're, we're not going to give you anything because we believe the officer feared for his life. So, I mean, that was in the back of my mind, mm -hmm. you know, during the course of that case. And again, you know, I was talking to these conservative guys this weekend who were like, well, what's the difference between an individual person, you know, committing a crime, act of violence versus a, a, a police officer? I said, well, if an individual person commits a crime against you, you call the police. But if an agent of the state who carries the imprimatur of all of us commits a crime against you, who are you going to call then? It's like a sense of helplessness, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it, th this impacts us, it affects us, uh, and we've got, to, uh, we've got to use healing tools to get out of it. One of them is a criminal prosecution, but the other one is, um, I mean, I'm looking forward to the day when we can have uh, members of law enforcement and citizens sit in a circle like that mm. and just have real talk about Here's how we feel this way. And let me just say this uh, on behalf of the police. Our society says we're going to residentially segregate people, right? Decades of redlining. And be based on the residential segregation, we're going to educationally segregate people. And then after that, we're going to limit people's job opportunity. And then if none of that works, we're going to send the police in to make sure 
that these people who live in this neighborhood don't feel a part of the larger society. Mm -hmm. You're gonna more or less keep them on the bantu stand if you know if you understand what I mean. And uh, so I mean the police are tasked with this role of maintaining the social order, and it's like, well, what about everybody else? <laughs> you know, I mean. We have what have we done about redlining and segregation in Minnesota? We we have it. What have we done? We've just now started to try to break up. So the city council passed a few uh, ordinances trying to say that these segregatory housing policies weren't going to be in existence anymore regarding regarding lot size and single occupancy and all this stuff. And and that's a big big controversy. Our society essentially is asking the police to maintain a vertical hierarchy. And uh, we've got to dig it all out. We've got to work on all of it. Uh, I, I think it's still the undone work, you know, uh, of the civil rights movement. And I'm talking about the one in the 1960s. It's still uh, work that we've got to sort out. And it's harder now because we don't have a court that wants to see that happen. Let's talk about the police. And just for the, my background, my father is a 37-year veteran in the New Orleans Police Department. My brother is a detective for the Houston Police Department. So I've also prosecuted and convicted lots of rogue police officers, including two sheriffs in the state of Louisiana. How about that case in Mississippi, man? <laughs> wow. They've, they've had, had some, there's more work to be done in Mississippi, Mississippi, <laughs> right. Mississippi as well. Um so for me, and I know this for you as well, you talk about in this book how this case, this prosecution is about upholding the dignity of police officers. It's not an anti-police right. officer case. It's a pro-police officer case. So for me, the idea of you as a, a thoughtful public servant being able to hold being pro-police, but also wanting to hold them accountable makes complete sense. And yet there are people in our community who struggle with the idea of holding both of those ideas at one time. Yeah. How can you convince the public at large that you are capable and that they should be capable of attaining both of those at the same time? Well, I, I don't know if I can convince anybody, I, but I will. I do maintain that position. I mean, I got a lot of good friends who have suffered tremendous loss. And, you know, for them, it was uh, involved, you know, unjust policing. So many of them uh, have, have, have extrapolated their horrible experience to the system and feel it's an irredeemable system. And my thought is, even if you say that's true, what, what, where does that leave us? <laughs> you know, because if my son gets arrested tonight, I'd like to make sure he gets safely to a cell and then gets safely to a, uh, and then he gets to face, you know, the, the criminal justice system. Um, to just say the system's messed up doesn't really doesn't really solve the problem. You know, we still have to figure out what we're going to do. At the end of the day, the question is, what are we going to do, mm -hmm. right? So uh, for me, you know, I would say that look, um, murder happens, rape happens, robbery happens, live shooters happen. And you've got to have somebody who is able to investigate and respond to those situations. So to say that we don't need any police, I'm like, okay, if you could get somebody to Uvalde, if you could get somebody to the grocery store in Buffalo, if somebody could have responded to... Uh, I mean, th these these situations occur in our in our world. You know, we we had I think we had like seventeen hundred untested rape kids. I mean, this that represents seventeen occasions of somebody being deeply violated and traumatized. And you need somebody. You don't have to call them a police officer. You can call them whatever you want, but you're gonna have to have somebody who's gonna deal with that situation. The question is, can we do it constitutionally? Can we do it in a way that is not racially biased? Uh, and can we do it in a way that inculcates actual trust and cooperation from community so that we can be more effective? Mm -hmm. If you compare Minneapolis and St. Paul, I'm not saying St. Paul is some, 
you know, perfect nirvana place. I will say that their clearance rate for homicide is way higher than Minneapolis. Hmm. And their trust is way higher than Minneapolis. Yeah. And their caustic, bad relationship with community is a lot lower than Minneapolis. Now, I'm not saying they're perfect. I know anybody come here and tell me these five things happen that are not good. And I'll be like, yeah, I don't disagree with that. What I am saying is you don't have a... You don't have a Hennepin County, St. Minneapolis. You, you don't have a Bob Kroll type over there. You know, you got them here, though. And I'm not saying everybody there is great. Again, you know, if you compare what I'm saying to perfection, perfection is going to win every time. But, you know, what I'm saying is Minneapolis, we can do way better than we're doing. We can do better than we're doing. And here's the other thing. If a doctor leaves a sponge in my body after he closes me up for surgery, you could say the medical profession's messed up. And you could say that doctor's messed up. You could say both are messed up. But somebody's got to get this sponge out of my body, right? You still got to have, there's a pragmatic question here that's got to be answered because the rape victims got to be interviewed. Yeah. Somebody's going to have to run that DNA and find that person who did that. And it, it it's so, and, and, you know, do we need to change how we do sentencing? Maybe. Do we need to change how we do, uh, you know, like there's a lot of reform, there's tons of reform that needed must happen, but the, it's all destroyed, burn it all down attitude. I don't, I just can't get on board with because it seems to me that it, we still, we're still left with ourselves. Yeah. And ourselves commit crimes against each other, and we've got to do something about that. Well, it's 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 noteworthy that you you analogize it to the medical profession when you talk about accountability, and you talk about the book in the book a lot about the legal profession and particularly the role of law. Yeah, the standard, the high, oftentimes insurmountable standard that must be met in order to successfully prosecute and hold a police officer accountable. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what that standard is and what reform, if any, needs to be made to it? Well, you know, um, there's, so, so there's, you know, the standard of any criminal case is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And sometimes when I was a defense attorney, public defender, I often felt like the standard that, that, it didn't take that much to convict my client, right? Uh, but 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 officers really do go in with a presumption of of innocence, and and the jury does require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, doubts are generally resolved in favor of the officer. People, you know, look, you know, we we grew up on dare, right? We grew up on dare. We grew up on any TV show you want to name. And people tend to believe that if you, what did your parents tell you when you were lost? If you're lost, call, look for a police officers. Yeah. And so, you know, that that's reality, right? But that standard around uh, 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 assessing their behavior by a reasonable officer. Right. Uh, well, the standard, with those circumstances, that legal standard and how difficult it is. Well, to, Graham versus, there's a, so in 1989, there was a case called Graham versus Connor. And this is an interesting case because before this, if you wanted to have a police officer found guilty or held civilly liable, you had to prove that they were operating out of malicious intent. That's what you needed to prove. Now, how do you prove malicious intent? So along comes one day in North Carolina, some guy who is a type one diabetic. And this guy is Mr. Uh, Graham. Mr. Graham is having a diabetic episode and he is in the car with his friend. He runs into the store. He grabs some orange juice and the line is really long. So he puts it back down and he runs back out. And then he gets in the car and they're looking for another grocery store. The officer comes up, stops the car, curses at him. And then he's a little incoherent because that's what happens when you're having a diabetic episode. The guy said, you ain't nothing but drunk, cussed him out, beat him up, broke his foot. All these horrible things happened to Mr. Graham because he was being suspected of stealing from the store. And then along comes the store and they said, nobody stole anything. So now what? So then they load him up in the back of the car and they throw his body out. And then Mr. Graham out on his lawn. Then Mr. Graham finds a lawyer and sues. 
And guess what? He loses <laughs> because the standard is malicious. Not only does he lose, he gets a direct verdict against him because there's no allegation of maliciousness. Right. So that's when the case goes up to the United States Supreme Court. And in that case, you know, uh, Thurgood Marshall was a very important part of that case and really drilled the lawyers in that matter and really helped change the standard. So now this standard is different. And the standard is that 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 you have to prove. Uh, so first of all, if an officer commits uh, to convict the police officer of a crime or even a civil liability, you've got to prove that the officer did the did the offensive act. That's usually pretty easy. You know, you know, Chauvin kneeled on the guy's neck. Some of you know, you know, Kim Potter did shoot. I mean, these things. But now, but then you've got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they that the officer did not act reasonably. You've got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the officer acted unreasonably. Now, this standard is not easy because. There will be experts and the experts will say, well, you know, the officer acted reasonably because the officer couldn't know this, couldn't know that, couldn't know the other thing. And there's a lot of doors out. In fact, every time you heard the defense in the Derek, in the, in the Derek Chauvin trial say how big George Floyd was, he was putting a little nugget on to see it was reasonable for him to act violently this right. way because look how big this guy is. Anytime he was saying he was out of control or incoherent, he was acting reasonably. Anytime they said anything that, you know, that sort of amounted to George Floyd somehow being irrational or fighting back, that was all to say, see, jury, even though the officer was wrong, he was reasonable in his assumptions. Mm -hmm. And that is a hard, what really did it for us is that we were able to show, okay, you're on the man's neck minutes two minutes, three minutes, four minutes after he has no pulse. How in the world is that reasonable? So in our case, in many, in many ways, that was the thing that they could never rebut. Yeah. You know, and it's objectively unreasonable to shoot somebody with a non-millimeter when you think you have a Glock in, when you think you have a taser in your hand. That's not reasonable conduct to shoot somebody with a firearm when you think you have a non-lethal weapon. You don't even know what you have in your hand. A reasonable officer knows that they have a gun in their hand, right? I love the, the trial, that trial theme. I think it was from rebuttal where he says, it's so unreasonable that even a child would know it. In fact, a child did know it. <laughs> well, that's why we called, uh, that's why we called Judea. Yeah. So yeah. some people might wonder, why'd you call the, the kid? Well, first, first of all, she was there. Yeah. She saw it. And I'm over here and, you know, we were in the meetings today and I'm listening to these young guys talk about uh, George Floyd happening when they were 11 and 12. And I'm like, wow, man, how's this going to affect their life? Because mm -hmm. because when I saw Detroit erupt, uh, I was three or four. And I remember military vehicles rolling down the street. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we called Judea because it was important, one, to show the jury that this happened in front of a child. And even a child could see that this is unreasonable conduct. And my argument was... The academy doesn't supposed to make you stupider. Mm. It's supposed to make you smarter. How can you justify this? And so, but all of that was our our case to show the unreasonability. That's right. And by the way, in the federal case, they didn't let them. They didn't let you do it. Testify. Right? They didn't let her testify, even though she had. She was there. She, she was, was there. Witness. How do you say a witness who's not who's there can't say what they saw? Well, it happened. Attorney General, we're going to pause for a moment and open it up to the floor. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for the public assembled to ask questions directly to your fantastic Attorney General. Uh, I know we're, we're running uh, close to time here, but we, we did save some time for questions from the public. Yes. Do we have microphones, by the way? Please uh, raise your hand and Val or I will come to you. That's true, too. Yeah. <laughs> project. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't talk loud enough, that's fine. <laughs> Anyone? Anybody? Anybody? I think we got some. Um, so when did you become an attorney? Me or uh, Mr. Polite? 
both of you actually. <laughs> you want to go first? I'm class of 2000 from Georgetown. I'm 1990, 10 years ahead, uh, and I went I went here. Okay. 1990. It seemed like a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was 10 years before I was born. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this See, that was unnecessary. That was, <laughs> that was just so un. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, but man. I think it was one year after Jeremiah was born. Right. <laughs> and he was running around here, you know. But uh, we're glad to have you here, though. But, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for saying that, yeah. Kim, because we are glad that you're here yeah. because I'm reminded daily that I am getting older and we need somebody to pass this yes, torch indeed. to you. So thank you for being yes, here. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi. So um, I previously worked with Communities United Against Police Brutality. And last year we did a lot of re-reviewing of the Minneapolis Police Department contract. And I know you mentioned that you don't think that police should be overpunished for anything, like based on being a police officer. That's true. So I'm just curious about, like, how do you feel about the things in their contract, like police don't have to, after an instant, speak to their other officers for like 24 to 48 hours? How do you feel about justifications right. like that then? I think that they should be treated like any other witness. I don't think... Yeah, I think they should. I think witness is a witness, and they should be, you know, you 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 give a statement about what you see saw her. I mean, when it comes to defend it, it's different because they have a right to not self incriminate. But uh, personally, I think that um, you know some of these things that allow them to not put a clear, accurate record as soon as possible uh, are 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 not are not right. All right, I have a, a question here about pretextual stops. Right. I know some cities, and I believe the state of Cal or, uh, Colorado are working through that. What are your thoughts for and against that, and what do you think about that concept? Well, pretextual stops, you guys, are just a pretext means like a fake reason for the stop. Generally, what it means is a racially biased stop that a police stop off, like a stop of a vehicle, and that when that happens, uh, generally, um, you know, generally they, there's a there's a demonstrate that you can demonstrate racial bias. Certainly, racially biased pretextual stops happen. There's no question; they've been documented over and over and over again, and uh, they certainly erode the quality of justice for all of us. Um, and here's the other thing: they don't necessarily lead to greater public safety. I mean, one of the things going on right now is that. John Choi uh, has said, if, you know, a few years ago, they did this experiment to look at the stop that stops. And they said, look, there's a certain number of stops that if you didn't do those stops, it wouldn't cost you in terms of finding, you know, evidence of a crime. And it might actually free your officers up to actually, you know, go after the people who really are doing more crime. So uh, right now, I mean, that 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 is an experiment that they are engaged in right now. And 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 so far, the results have been pretty good. I mean, there might be somebody who knows more about it than I do, but I can tell you that John Choi is a good person to talk to about this. I'll, I'll also say this. Officers will often say that these, auto, these vehicle stops are dangerous. And there's some evidence to show that that's, that is accurate. If we could reduce some of the unnecessary ones, maybe we're going to make that might be good for officer safety, might be good for safety of others as well. So um, I will say not every stop that officers do is pretextual. I mean, some people, I mean, I would say this, if you're driving without lights in the back of your car, you should stop. If you're dri driving in a dangerous, in a way that has is a hazard to other drivers, you should be stopped. But the old thing about the air freshener hanging off the thing, I, I just don't know if that's worth it, man. You know, it, may, maybe some of those things are not worth doing, but I will tell you that, um, so does that answer your question? Well, yes, it does. But I, I, I believe that most of those stops are not pretextual. I mean, you stop a vehicle for a headlight out, hey, fix your headlight. It's yeah. no big deal. In fact, you could say it's a positive contact with the driver saying, hey, fix your headlight. Okay, got it. Most of those by far are those kind of almost a public relation things. Yeah. 
I will uh, let you know I'm a retired police officer from Bloomington. Sure. And I, over my career, probably made thousands of minor traffic stops. Right. Almost always it's fix your headlight. You don't have tail lights. Here's a fix a ticket. And the person says, thanks, I didn't know about that. Right. The ones, and I would agree, if you see an African-American male and say, I want to stop that guy. Oh, he's got a tail light out. That's a pretextual stop. But I'll also tell you in the middle of the night, many times you don't have any idea who the driver is because right. you know it's the middle of the night. So I I think it's uh I would not be in favor of uh precluding uh officers from making minor traffic stops from the context of they stop, they give you a warning, and you get on your way. Well, you would agree with me, a pretextual stop and a minor traffic stop. Are two different things. Correct. Right. Correct. Uh, you know, so you and I agree, pretextual stops we shouldn't do. Correct. But, you know, but let me just tell you this. Um, I think that I'd be, I'd like to study this thing a little bit because I I do think that there is a certain value in making sure that our roads are safe and pe where people are enforcing the traffic code. Right. I also think that there are sometimes some stops that I think we think they yield more criminal evidence than they really do, you know? And I, I just don't know. I think it's something that needs to be studied more. I mean, so for example, uh, they had this stop and search thing in New York for many years. And uh, everybody kind of thought, well, you got to have it because otherwise, you know, crime will get out of control. The city of New York was sued, found to be doing some things they shouldn't do, the unconstitutional stops. These were not vehicle stops, by the way. And then after they stopped doing it, you know, you know, the, the, they didn't find it. They didn't find more drugs. They didn't find more guns. They didn't find more stuff. So I think that, uh, thank you for your service, by the way. I do thank you and I appreciate your work. I also just know that we should never stop trying to learn more about the criminal justice system. What work isn't what works the thing we want to do more of, and what don't work we should want to do less of. So thank you for your service, and uh, thanks for pointing out your the things you did because I think they're very important for this conversation. And thank you for serving the city of Bloomington for so many years. Other questions? Yeah. I actually have a question. <laughs> All right. Can you describe how you were feeling when that verdict came in and if it made you optimistic for the future? You know, I was uh, I was feeling numb. And I'll tell you this, I was not at all sure we were going to win. In fact, I kind of assumed we probably weren't going to. But um, other people in my office were giddy and happy that, but but I was like, you guys are going based on the fact that we did a good job. I'm going based on history. <laughs> and so um, when judge read those verdicts, I felt like I wanted him to read them again because I didn't quite sure I heard what I thought I heard. Uh, even now, though, I, I will tell you this. And a lot of people have got pissed at me saying this, but I still feel it. Maybe it's because I was a criminal defense lawyer for so many years, but I knew his, his Chauvin's life would never be the same. And locking him up like that is uh, what the law requires, but it's not going to bring George Floyd back. And hopefully it will um, cause some critical conversations in our country around around policing. Uh, and I'm still I'm still sorting out how I feel about it, everything. I don't have any regrets at all, you know, but I do feel like, my big fear is that, okay, so now we think this thing is done with now, right? We, we've taken care of that problem. Um, and I'm not sure that we have. I mean, look at what happened to Tyree Nichols in Memphis. You know, so uh, we still have ways to go. But let me just tell you, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to have met some of the people along the way since the verdict. I got to meet a woman named Carrie L. Horn. Have y'all ever heard of Carrie L. Horn? Who heard of Carrie L.? Let me, can I tell about Carrie L? Carrie L. Horn was a Buffalo police, uh, police officer. She was a police officer in the city of Buffalo. And she, one day, her and her partner, 
went to make an arrest of some people in the house. She said, turn around, assume the position, cuff, 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 walks the guy out. Her partner doesn't come out. She's like, what's going on? So she goes in there and she sees this guy pounding his fist on the sus cuffed suspect's head. She said, and she physically stops him from doing it. She says, stop that. You cannot do that. And he says, get your hands off me. He threw a few colorful words in there. And she's like, you're going to be in trouble. You hit a confined suspect. You're going to get it. This is against the rules. Well, somebody got in trouble all right. Her. She spent 15 years fighting to get her pension back. And then the city of Buffalo passed something called Cariel's Law, which says that if you're an officer and you see somebody doing something wrong, you have a duty, an affirmative obligation to, if, in a, to, to say, stop it. Meantime, this guy, this guy was convicted of a federal mm -hmm. criminal civil rights violation and did time for it. And if they'd have just listened to Cariel Horn, a sincere, dedicated person who joined the police department because she wanted to help people, he wouldn't have been in prison. He might not be on the police department no more. But let me tell you, there's other jobs, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I will tell you this, you know, people say, you know, uh, you know, uh, I think too many of us who believe that there needs, we need to have to have um, police accountability, you know, don't, we don't acknowledge enough that there are people like Carrie O'Horn who do this job right every single day. And then there are George, and then there are Derek Chauvin's who don't, you know. But what we, but what we've got to do is understand that our system, talking about housing, education, and healthcare, and everything, has racial bias embedded in it. Policing does too, in my opinion. And we've got to get about the work of making sure that we have liberty and justice for all, right away. And we've got to fix the system systemically, and we can start here, but we can't end here. I've been a big advocate of that peer intervention uh, training uh, and requirements for officers. One of the wheels that you talk about in the book, though, is this, yeah. this wheel of tragic incident, commission, <laughs> right. report, recommendations, more training on officers, incident again, rinse and repeat, yep. right? And yep. you yep. talk about how these four officers had the entire battery of training uh, available to them. They, we had all the records showing what, that they had fulfilled all those training obligations, yep. and yet it made no difference on that particular day at that particular moment. That's right. How do you break that wheel? How do you make training? Is, is training even a way to break it or so, is it something else? So I can, I still believe training is important, but I leave train, but if train, training with no accountability is dudes sitting in the back playing candy crunch. Yeah. Yeah. Training, training with no accountability is whatever. If you have training and then you say, if you don't do this, you might live to regret it. Now you might get somebody's attention and you might save somebody's life. I, I think that I would, I would do a few things. And I think Minneapolis has done some of these things. I'm not certain. Maybe somebody can correct me. But there's no, that if you have a record of like more than, a certain number of, of uh, you know, excessive force complaints, you need to be off the FTO list for a while. Y'all, Do y'all know what I mean by this? I know some of y'all know intimately what I know mean by it, but some of y'all may not know. So FTA is a field training officer. And Derek Chauvin was a field training officer for J. Alexander King. So here's what's actually happening on that corner. On that corner, what's happening is this. All that stuff you learned in, in, the, in the academy, rookie, it's all BS. Here's how you do copping. Here's how you a here's how you'd be a cop. We can't, so there some people are undermining training because we got the FTO because you've been around a long time. I think you get a certain number of complaints. You're gonna have to, you should have some kind of an intervention, what's going on with you. And then you should certainly be taken off the FTO list. And we don't want, and we should look at our academy as precious. You don't let anybody talk to the academy graduates. You only let the best people talk to them because we're trying to create a new cultural experience, right? And look, the policing is deeply steeped in culture and tradition. 
Um, and so we need to change that tradition. We need to change, you know, we, where how we recruit police officers. We need to, uh, I think a lot of times people get, a, people, we draw from the military a lot of times. I'd like to see us get more people from social work background. What about the computer science department? How much crime is cyber crime? You need some cops who know how to do that. Accounting. There's a lot of ways to stop people from criminally victimizing other people, and not all of them require you to lift 200 pounds and run a five-minute mile. Now, I'm not saying that's not important for some jobs in policing, but it's not necessary for all jobs in policing. This is this is this is a key win to take over here. <laughs> two more. We'll take two more. Yes. <laughs> I thought we had one up up the top center. Thank you for that. Hey, how's it going? Hey, hey. Um, so I uh you kind of got at this a little bit, but you know, I know that we've had some time over the years to talk about other cases like the killing of Laquan McDonald and right. the prosecution of um, uh, Officer Van Dyke, and uh, and uh, you know, you kind of got into the kind of the way that that happens, right? Where uh, that case, I think, has a few. Not that it's every case is different when you get into the granular details, but you've got a murder, a heinous murder, you've got protests, you've got uh, right. a second degree murder conviction. And this is happening, what, four years prior to then, you know, uh, George Floyd's murder. Um, do you ever have any concerns about the ways in which, you know, the, uh, uh, the trial can become kind of a victim of its own success, right? Folks, hold this up as we did it, right? It's kind of mission accomplished banner. And, uh, and, and then everybody, and then the, the, the air sort of is like out of the sails when it comes to broader systemic change. Man, it's it's my biggest worry about the about uh, the Floyd case. It's my biggest worry. I mean, and 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 see, criminal convictions. By the time somebody's committed a crime, they done they did something really bad. There's a lot of immoral, wrong conduct and rule break breaking that is not a crime. So, I mean, if all we do is say, "Well, we convicted somebody," what have we really said? I don't think we've said that much. I mean, maybe we've said we've let this thing get to an extreme lack of control. So, like, so what I what I what I said after we got that verdict back is I said to, I said, look, you know, now it's in your hands, you know, and what I meant by that is now we need to make sure that if you get a certain amount of excessive force complaints that you, a tickler system rings and you have to have an intervention mm -hmm. and you got to be you're off the fto list and we're going to have a, a a system where we're not going to have pretextual stops and we have to have a system where if you well like what about the guy in in cleveland who jumps out of a car and shoots a 12 year old within seconds of getting out of the car but a police department in the suburbs of Cleveland said this guy is too unstable to be a police officer in our department. He's got to go. And Cleveland's like, oh, we'll hire him. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is in the Tamir Rice case. So you got to have a system where you can't just do wrong here, go somewhere else. You know, uh, I mean, we've done some good things with the post board. Um, you know, but but I, I think one of the things we've got to do that I really believe we've got to do is if you look at a, if you look at, we talk about this thing about bad apples, right? You heard the bad apple analogy. Well, here's the thing. You can't let a bad apple stay in the barrel because if you do, what's going to happen? It's going to ruin them all, right? Now, here's the thing. Most organizations, you got 10% of the people who will do the right thing no matter what. People don't, they don't have to be watched. They're just moral. They're good. They're going to do the right thing. You got 10% who will only do the right thing if they're watched. And then you got a bunch of people in the middle. If you have a department where these guys on this side are the, are the, are the macho, tough guys who run things and are the social controllers, what happens to the 10% who are doing the right thing? You, they're going to get ran out of the department. 
They're not going to be able to stay. Carrie L. Horn will be chased out of the department. And Bob Crow will be in the department. He'll be the president of the union, which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And so we need to create a culture where doing the right thing is rewarded, doing the wrong thing is punished. Not be, because that because that the big group in the middle who is like, look, I'm just trying to keep my job. I actually think that's where Derek Chauvin belongs. Derek Chauvin was not the worst. If you rank the the officers with the worst, with the most excessive force complaints to the bet to the least, Derek Chauvin would not be in the top ten. Did you know that? And he had around 18. Well, it was a district that was known as being a playground for rogue cops. It, it was, was a news it, article written with that exact title. And the third precinct in that, particular. The right? third precinct in particular. Yeah. So we've yeah. got to create an environment where, I mean, I think a lot of people worried about police recruiting today are like, well, you don't criticize policing because then people don't want to be cops. Let me tell you this. I think the real problem of policing recruitment, first of all, we have a general recruitment problem for any job. But aside from that, if you told somebody you're going to get to help people who have been fa who faced the worst moment in their life, and you're going to be the one who's going to help get them through the toughest thing that ever happened to them, there's a lot of people who have a compassionate heart who will say, "I want, I'll do that job." But if you say, "But you got to ride next to somebody who calls people of color filthy names, who has no respect for women, who will go, who will knock your teeth out if you say the wrong thing to them." The, those bad guys are the ones chasing good people out of policing. Why don't we try that and say, because I know a lot of people who I think would be good officers, but they don't want to be associated. You know, and so I think that, um, you know, not everybody is George, is Derek Chauvin. And so it's unfair to a certain extent, but we've got to accept the fact that Derek Chauvin diminished the esteem of policing in the eyes of the public. And that's a problem we've all got to try to overcome. For our, our so our, for our own benefit. One, I want to leave with one final question here: pulling the lens back out from police to public health to yeah. public safety to those aspirational concepts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. You, in your book, talking about there is more work to be done. What can you say to the members of the public, not those prosecutors or police officers, but the average citizen, particularly the average young person you, that's in this audience, what can they do thank you, to achieve those goals? Well, first of all, thank you for our lovely evening, man. It's been great Absolutely. taking spending time with you. Can we hear it for Ken? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> understand that on the other side of police accountability is public safety. It's not lawlessness, it's not anarchy, and it's not chaos. On the other side of solving this problem is a police department that communities feel good about, trust, cooperate with. That's what's on the other side of this, not anarchy. If we do police accountability, we will have safer communities, fewer human rights violations, and I believe greater prosperity, because if you have a community where people are, are known to suffer criminal victimization, that tends to diminish economic opportunity in that same place. So I think that um, it's all it's on our interest to get this thing solved. And we can. Let's break the wheel. Our fantastic attorney general votes, 2000. <clears throat> And kind of to stay where they are, uh, we just have one more voice to close us out, and that is um, a voice to help knit this conversation together. Um, Dr. Blessett, uh, Associate Professor Brandy Blessett, is going to offer just a few reflections um, on this evening's discussion. Dr. Blessett's commitment to social consciousness and community engagement has made her a respected figure within our school and well beyond. Uh, with a background rooted in education and a key focus on centering the lived experiences of marginalized communities, Dr. Blessed's reflections on tonight's conversation will undoubtedly offer valuable insights and inspire us to carry forward the important work of advancing justice and equity. Dr. Blessed. Can we get another round of applause for a wonderful discussion? So I very much appreciated the conversation today between A.G. Ellison and Mr. Polite. 
particularly because it elevated the challenges of trying to achieve justice in a criminal legal system that has rarely been fair and impartial to Black people who are victims of police violence and the families that are left to pick up those pieces. Breaking the wheel offers insight into all of the moving parts needed for the state to lead a prosecution to hold Derek Chauvin accountable for the murder of George Floyd. The prosecution's approach was methodical and nuanced. It was challenging, it was costly. Um, it was even threatening at some point. The prosecuting team had to humanize George Floyd to work against the dehumanized, to, to work against coded language and dog whistle politics that not only dehumanized him, but legitimized the use of excessive force by police. This unfortunately is not unique to George Floyd's case, but is present in countless cases and broader narratives linking black people to criminal pro proclivities and animalistic behavior. Too often people are marginalized by society's mythical yet powerful hierarchies, rarely, and, and they rarely achieve or receive the compassion, empathy, or the benefit of the doubt when engaging with police officers. To be black, indigenous, an immigrant, a non-English speaker, LGBTQIA, has led to policies that criminalize people for just trying to live full and authentic lives. In a country that incarcerates more people than the entire rest of the industrialized world, more jails and more police are clearly not the answer. Justice continues to be denied due to a focus on punishment rather than an appreciation for accountability and one's humanity. So I ask, what is justice? Is a conviction of Derek Chauvin justice? Yes, it is accountability, but is it justice? And if it's justice, then for whom? Even after a successful conviction, A.G. Ellison revealed or recognized that there is still so much work to do. Justice requires a collective commitment to community rather than rugged individualism. It requires us to prioritize people over profits and accountability over institutions. Justice looks like the equitable investment in historically disenfranchised communities where those neighborhoods get a tremendous influx of resources to repair generations of harm. Justice looks like adequate housing. It looks like access to healthcare, clean air and water, dignified employment and quality education. When people have their basic needs met, the reliance on police to solve social problems diminished tremendously. To fully actualize justice, we need to be willing to ask ourselves difficult questions, to understand how we can stop perpetuating injustice within, with our attitudes and behaviors, to be willing to engage in difficult conversations with families and friends, and be committed to the ongoing and hard work of eradicating systemic oppression. The justice that we seek is not out there for someone else to achieve. Instead, it's something that each of us has a responsibility to work toward every single day because there is still so much work to do. So I leave you with a call to action, a call to define what justice is for you and your community, a commitment to doing one thing within your sphere of influence to move the justice needle forward. And so I'd like to thank Dean Bochway, uh, Mr. Poli, uh, A.G. Ellison, Kathy Quick, all of the organizers of the event, and to each of you in the audience for your participation. So just outside the atrium, there is a book signing. And so I'd like to thank you all and have a great night.